oldest houses in Door County and it's located on a hillside overlooking Ephraim and Eagle Harbor. The interview was with Jim Field, who's on your left, and Maurice Larson, whom will be seen on your right. Jim's family has owned the Irison House for many years. Jim himself is a retired history professor from Swarthmore College in Ohio. Joining Jim is Maurice Larson, a lifelong resident of Ephraim and a knowledgeable keeper of a great deal of Ephraim's history. Here's a question for you. What was Iverson really like? Now I know that neither of you knew Iverson, but based on your perception of Iverson as he was in the early days, what was he like as a man? Maury, what, what did you hear as a kid about Iverson? Uh, well, Iverson, uh, he was uh, about as tough a man physically as you could be. And he was very well educated, and he was a wonderful craftsman. Mm -hmm. He, uh, like he made that uh, uh, pulpit over in the Raven Church there, and they dealt all with hand tools. Mm -hmm. And I assumed that he'd done quite a bit of the work on this building. He did all the uh, uh, doors and windows and uh, moldings and yeah, things. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure he did a lot of the work. He had some other people helping him with the whole yeah. job of smoothing out the logs. But uh, you see, all this work was all—all all he had to work with was wooden planes, and the wooden planes had, uh, uh, well, they made a knife for each molding, and so mm -hmm. you had, well, mm -hmm. if you, you could insert different knives, but usually the craftsmen had a wooden knife for each uh, particular operation. Now these uh, wood, uh, these are all wide. Uh, uh, it looked like about 12 or better. It's bigger, it was a big, big board. Yeah, yeah, and those came from uh, across from Menominee because uh, they had sawmills over Menominee already at that time. He got the lumber for the first church, he says in his memoirs, from Cedar River. Cedar River, well, it could have been Cedar River yeah. too, but it was across, across the valley. Yeah, sure. And they were, uh, he wanted a modern building, he didn't want a log building. Part of this is log building. The main part is all log under the board and bottom. Uh -huh. And then the addition you know, put on by Grenfell's is just double sheeting. Yeah. So much. Well, Grenfell was not a carpenter the way I was more. At the end of it's my, 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 my grandparents put on most of it. See, this, this uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a summer kitchen or just a kitchen. My dad put that on. I believe you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was done in the 20s, I think, early 20s. There is a little bit of it there in a 1940. 13 picture we have, oh, yeah. but uh, just the first half of it, the rest I of it was put on in the 20s because when I was small, uh, they were cooking out there, but the sink was still in the the dining room, and there was a pump to the system there. You see, that time, uh, well, they, they didn't, there wasn't really any, uh, what you would call a plumber around. So Your father was a plumber. My dad done the plumber. <laughs> he was the plumber, the sure, village yeah. plumber. Sure. Well, he had a complete set of plumbing tools, you know, and mm -hmm. so he would do the, uh, he would put in the toilets or whatever it needed and back in those days and sink and that stuff. And remember, he had, <laughs> when you come to do an inch and a half pipe, uh, I still got the thing, it's, uh, the handles are about that long, mm -hmm. and uh, one <laughs> man on each side, and <laughs> it was terrible hard to pull, you know. Mm -hmm. But we got the treads on. Mm. Uh, was Iverson a big man? No, no he wasn't a big man. He, I never saw the man, but from his pictures, he uh, was, um, I would say, five foot ten, wouldn't you say? I have no idea, but five foot ten would be big for those days. Uh, well, no, somebody grew up because in uh, you take like that uh, Onison, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Baron Onison, he was a uh, six footer. And he was the first white mm -hmm. child born, and uh, there were uh, several big people those days. Yeah. My dad was a, well, he was a big, man. biggest man. He was about five, ten or eleven, I guess. He was not as tall as I am, but he was. Um, Iverson apparently was a good preacher. I mean, he there was he was three languages. Would you say that he oh, was charismatic? Right. You know, the word charismatic is tossed around spellbinding. Uh, was he a spellbinder as a I preacher? I don't believe he was an evangelist type of spellbinder. Uh, I would assume from what I've read and heard that he was uh, a 
good preacher. He knew how to preach, and uh, he was very well educated. But uh, I don't think he was no spellbinder like the, the evangelists do. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Jim. Um, to what degree do you feel that this really has become your house? Or do you ever have the feeling that you're just sort of a caretaker for Iverson's baby, his his wonderful I house? think, well, I pointed out that the, uh, my family has owned it a lot longer than the Iverson's plus the Grenfell's, so it's my house. It's the only house I got now. And, uh, but at the same time, we hear the Parsons ghost in the attic every now and then. The, the best, the nicest house, house in Oh, I think, he, I think he saw to it that the... Yeah. And yeah, the congregation the apparently wanted house. that. Oh, yeah. yeah. This was the yeah. finest house. And they had, they had services in there think, before they built the first church. Mm -hmm. I think it was the first house that completed. I don't know when it was completed. You so. know, his memoirs give you, sort of suggest to you that they completed the main part of it the first year they were here. Yeah. I don't believe that. I think they're in such hard case shape they probably put up a shanty and uh, worked in the house for a while. Well, but it, it, it I be. don't know. And his memoirs uh, aren't precise on it. How many coats of whitewash would you estimate some? <laughs> well, every time we put one on, some comes off. You know, <laughs> you know they talk about uh, shortly after 1853, when the earliest uh, came, making trips to Green Bay for provisions, making trips on foot. Was Sturgeon Bay, Bay not available at that time, or why did they go all the way to Green Bay? It wasn't much of Sturgeon Bay. Is that right? Uh, a couple of cabins. Well, I think Ephraim was probably established before Sturgeon Bay. Or, uh, again, uh, the memoirs, he says that uh, he went up and looked at Sturgeon Bay when they were still in Green Bay because land was available, and he found a couple of cabins there. So there wasn't much there. But uh, it was hardly anything, but he didn't like it because it was all softwood. So he, then he found he thought this was better because it was more hardwood jam. Well, I can answer that question, why they went to Green Bay. Uh, first, number one, uh, they would use the ice to travel, and they would walk the ice all the way to Green Bay and pull a sled with provisions, where, as there wasn't any road uh, much of the way to Sturgeon Bay, and by the time that they'd go by ice all the way to Sturgeon Bay, they would be in Green Bay. I see. Okay. see uh, I would imagine it would be close to 70 miles if you went, followed Straight the shoreline yeah. in, in the canal and way back, yeah. you know, it, I imagine it would be and then they wouldn't have what they needed there anyway. No. So, and then I guess they were they were they were able to get credit in Green Bay. That was another yeah. thing. They, he apparently Iverson had acquaintances in Green Bay would would give him credit. I know one period there they they got credit and he he personally signed a note for it. He would deliver so many fence posts. That's right. Uh, to pay the bill, and they did it. And that's where the market for fence posts was, was down there, yeah, too. Yeah, right. And telegraph the fence every ball here. Yeah. Uh, Each other. Uh, yeah, I think Calvert was a brother. Brother. Oh, was he? Yeah. Yes. yes. They were but, brothers. They came uh, together. And that brings up another question. Why did they pick Ephraim? Why did they come to Ephraim? Well, he wasn't among the first settlers, apparently. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, yeah. He came I, in later and bought up cheap the land. Yeah. I, uh, when the... When she, the uh, from the parish was for the phone. Uh, uh, Timmons down, you know him, don't you? Timmons, is a uh, relative. Uh, he's married to, uh, I think his, well, he was married. I wonder if he was married to one of the Anderson girls or whether he was in the family to mm -hmm. marry somewhere. And I asked, asked him, I said, how could a fellow like, where did he get the money from, this uh, Oslock, to come in here and yeah. build a store and everything? Well, he said he was a millwright over in Escanaba for several years. And, I spoke, and he said he saved his money, and of course he didn't take a hell of a lot of money them days, you know. So I suppose maybe he had saved a hundred, hundred and fifty, which was enough to buy the land. And and uh, like uh, Halver said, uh, the wages weren't much. I suppose they got a dollar a day, yeah. or maybe if they, a good man would get two, but most of them only got a dollar a day, so they could build, you know. Yeah. And uh, lumber was cheap, and. Well, that whole dock, I don't imagine it cost him more than, say, I would say he probably didn't have to pay out over $50 at the very most. because He got the land from Iverson yeah. at cost, of what it cost oh, Iverson, okay. on condition that he put up a dock so that they could then start exporting fence posts yeah, and things right. like that. Yeah. 
Well, the establishment of that dock then was a, uh, a major milestone in the early development of Ephraim, I suppose. It would have yeah, to be. It was, because sure. they were able to Open have, it get, up. you know, afterwards they could get boats. And you, I, don't, uh, I don't know when that, when that dock was built. There's a plaque there saying it was built. I think that they've got that 1853 on there. That's, that's wrong. That really. must be wrong. I have they had, had steamboats going in and out of Fish Creek before they were going in and out of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. And okay. at that time, the, uh, I guess it was pretty impossible even to walk to Fish Creek because uh, uh, they tell about there was uh, just nothing but, well, you take from where the Charlie's place is now and over to the high school, that was just a, a muck swamp. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And they would uh, have to take their shoes off they want to keep mm -hmm. them dry walk in the water up to their knees till they got over to the other, to, to the dry ground again. There, there, were, there were two women who had a major influence uh, in the early days of, of Ephraim. One was Tilly Valentine Anderson, and of course the other was Lizzie Anderson. What can you tell me? What this are place your... was full of strong women. Yeah. Okay. Do any other women stand out in your minds as having made major contributions? It depends what you mean by a major contribution, I suppose. So. Well, for example, Lizzie was involved in village politics. She was a uh, clerk. She was village clerk. Yeah. And uh, she was a persuader, as I understand it. And Maury, maybe you know more about that than I. mean, she knew how to get the most out of people. And my impression is that uh, Tilly Valentine was a, a, a little more direct maybe rubbed a few people the wrong way. What can you tell me about these two ladies? You want my version or Jim's? <laughs> <laughs> both, I want both well, of You've got the advantage of years on me, Mars. You probably know more. I well, think they're both powerful women, and uh, I like them both I, very much. Kind uh, of a genteel sort of person. Yes, she was fair. Uh, pretty girl. She had a uh, nice shape and everything. And she had one romance, but that I don't know. She, uh, and she was disappointed in that the guy married somebody else because he had to. <laughs> so uh, she hear the historian's view of uh, Tilly and Lizzie now, Jim. You said that you consider them both to be powerful women. What do you want to elaborate on that a bit? No, I would just say that uh, I thought. Most of the women of that generation I knew up here, knowing them as a child, were all pretty strong characters, and I could list a bunch more, but uh, I, I remember Lizzie much better than I remember Tilly. Uh, I guess she lived longer, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I remember childhood feeling uh, that uh, I liked both of them, they were very nice to me, and uh, I felt easy with them. Well, we could go through all the hotels. Every one of them was a, a powerful woman yeah, back up. Yes, yes. We can start with the, uh, and then she inherited, and then they kept on with it from there. And then we can skip over to the Eagle Inn. Well, there was Mrs. B.D. Thorpe. Well, and she built that place and run it. I suppose B.D. probably helped her a little with the building, but he, uh, he was always in politics or something, and he was... He run the country club. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, I think it's uh, where Smith Lodge was afterwards. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was a country club at that time. They had a golf course yeah. there, and he run that. So it was up to her to run the whole operation. Well, then we get over to the Edgewater. There was Mrs. Helders, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she run that operation as long as she was able. Uh, because Ellis, well, he was quite a tippler, and he didn't worry too much about <laughs> anything else. But he. He and Ole Olsen were fishing some, so then, uh, but she she run the whole, whole show there. And then we get down to Hillside down there, uh, Serena, she was, run the whole thing. Ole was, mm -hmm. he didn't bother his head too much with the hotel, and uh, he Serena, was fishing. What, Serena who? Last name? Uh, Olsen. Serena Olsen, okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there, uh, I was a... Uh, first cousin to my dad. I, I don't know now which side that was on. It, was, it must have been on Serena's side, I guess. And I remember the old uh, Morton and He was one of the originals here. Uh, he was a tough old gapper. He lived to be in his 90s, I guess. But he's done a lot of walking. He'd walk all the way from here to Ellison Bay. He used to sell fruit trees. You know? And he'd walk all the way to Ellison Bay selling fruit trees. 
Well, I suppose we should go on to then. Miss, then we got to the Evergreen Beach over here, and that was um, what was her name? Well, Portel was the husband. Well, he built the hotel. Portel was a good carpenter, and he built the hotel. Hogan's. And uh, she more or less run the hotel too. You know, they, women have to take care of the cooking. That yeah. it was all American plan those days. Yeah. And so naturally, they had to take care of the cooking. And I suppose that uh, they probably took care of the business end of it too. Although Fordle was, he was pretty sharp and everything. In fact, Fordle built a boat down there in the front yard of the Evergreen Beach and launched it on the beach there. And then Do you remember that boat? I saw the ribs of it, that's all. Oh. I see what happened there. The Ole Olsen going in partnership with him. I was, was, I think, about a 60 foot sailing vessel. And they, you know, haul produce and lumber and stuff of this. And then they got in an argument. Uh, so Portley took the damn thing out to Eagle Island one day. There was a good north wind, but he tacked out there and got out there. And then he hoisted full sail and let her go right up on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> right where Malcolm Vale's boathouse, remember that used to be a boathouse? That was the only building on the beach, remember that green building? Yeah. Malcolm Vale's boathouse. And there it ended up on the beach. <laughs> I I don't know, Portal owned the, I suppose he owned the land at that time. I know when we were kids going to school, we'd walk along the beach and the ribs were still sticking out of it there mm -hmm. at that time. Well, any of the, did any of the summer residents make many contributions to the uh, to Ephraim in the old days? Uh, not to or they just knowledge. sit around and enjoy themselves? And, yeah, that's yeah. about it. It depends what you mean by contributions, but it'd be hard to find them, I think. Yeah, okay. Unless you think uh, the Rock Club is a contribution. Yeah, well, that's that's later. That's later. Yeah. I mean, that was also a mixed operation. Yeah. And some, but, some, uh, some there were a lot of them that were give contributions in the later years, like in the 20s and on, you know, like Fulda and, and Warren Davis mm -hmm. and David Stevens and a lot of those, they were very influential in, in a lot of things. You know, they talk about Professor's Row. Well, that's... Uh, right. Uh, and there were a lot of professors here. Uh, there may have been, but I, mean, I don't know they call it Professor's Row, but all the professors I knew didn't live on Professor's Row. Well, that was a... Well, the Professor Moss did. He lived up, up on, up well, on that's the bluff the, above the ghost. Yeah, but well, that's the one they call Professor Row, isn't it? Uh, along where the Knutson... Below the Knutson house, they're along the... The shore, the shore. Oh, that, oh, there. From, yeah. from, the, from the dock oh, up yeah. to Clipson oh, House. I, I see, I yeah. didn't really know there were any and, professors uh, down there. The, uh, we had an opera singer there, but I don't remember any professor. What the hell was his name? Basil Rysdale? Yeah. Basil Rysdale. yeah. Basil oh, yes. Rysdale. Yeah. I've heard of him. He had such a, a godly, a strong voice, they claim he could, they could hear him for a mile. Well, the more. story is he ran out of gas in yeah. an outboard boat out by Eagle Island. Yeah. And he got up and uh, <laughs> took a big breath and yelled, and they heard him on the dock and yeah. came out to rescue him. <laughs> How well did people get along in the old days? Um, did everyone get along, or was there were there politics in 1858? I don't believe any, any village in, whatever, in which everybody always gets along, but most of them won't. Well, I'd say they got along much better than they do today. I mean, there there isn't a conflict amongst people. Do you agree, or, Jim? You, you think that's so? Pardon? I'm yeah, asking Jim I, if he I agrees. Think so. uh, of course, I was just a summer fellow, but uh, well, coming up here for the summer, it seemed to me I was rejoining the extended family. Okay, so there was a family feeling within the community. Is that well, right? For, ch for children. Yeah. Like, my, like me. Like but Maury's expressed this before that that people depended more on each other and were willing to give more of the, themselves in the old days than they do now. Is that right, Maury? Well, there was a friendship amongst people. I mean, uh, well, for instance, my dad would a lot of times go to church and uh, then there'd be some special meeting at night and, well, he didn't have, didn't hitch up the team for it, so he'd go. And then he'd, uh, uh, Olson's at Hillside would invite him down for dinner and he'd stay there in the afternoon and go to church in the evening and walk home. Uh, uh, those kind of things are not really done today uh, like they were then. And then, well, we'll just take like this old Martin Olson, that uh, great grandfather to Bruce. Uh, they had an 80 up on uh, County Trunk A, and uh, they had they had some land broke up. They had a little farmland there, a little barn, and I don't know what he done up there all the time. Maybe he planted and cultivated or whatever. But he used to walk up 
to our old farm and they'd stop in there and the mothers and she'd invite them in have cake and coffee and then they would uh, talk uh, I mean he'd give her the news because he was right in the hub of sure. everything so yeah. he'd get the news there and then he'd walk up to uh, Sir and Albertson they lived on Maple Grove he was a, a tailor by trade they had just 40 acres there I guess uh, where the end of the airport is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> she'd have coffee and cake there. And that, in your mind, uh, made a difference in terms of the development of the village. The building of the docks, certainly. I think the building one. of the condos. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but that's mu that's much later. Yeah, I know. Uh, the building of Anderson Dock that that had to make a tremendous difference. Then the, the Goodrich boats coming. Mm -hmm. what, what other? things uh, represent stages in the evolution, the early evolution of well, the building. Well, they got a road through the station bay. That made ah, considerable difference. Okay. When, when was that road built? About? Well, it wasn't very good until quite late because when my grandparents first came, they'd take the train to uh, Menominee and come across by boat rather than come through the station bay. Good. And come yeah, by yeah. Road. It was a fair road, I guess, in the teens. I, uh, in fact, I, I got a a report from the town of Gibraltar when Ephraim was in this was a report I think it was 1916 and uh, then they uh, Holland was chairman of the township at that time and he gave this complete report and the total tax roll for that year to include Fish Creek and Ephraim well the whole Gibraltar area mm -hmm. including Ephraim was 13,000 mm -hmm. <laughs> now a lot of people pay that one place but anyway, they, uh, they said in there about they were had raised, I think, $300 to continue the road up as far as Peter Knutson. But it was just gravel, you know. Mm -hmm. I think Tom Carmody was the contractor in that road. He was a he had road building equipment, but they all they had was gravel. Mm -hmm. So then they got the macadam. That was a sort of a, a I don't know, how would you explain macadam? That was kind of a... A little similar to blacktop, but it got quite hard, but it wasn't good as blacktop and break up easy. It's well, they had they, for a long time, it was just plain gravel, and they began to oil the gravel, yeah. to keep the dust down. Yeah. But uh, I know uh, back when I was a kid, well, it, the roads were awful dusty. I know oh. you'd see a car. <laughs> I, know, mm -hmm. I know that Clarence Smith used to tell the story about Lanky Gibbs. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah, I remember Clarence. Well, he used to live up in the upper road here. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he was head of a touring car. They were all open, all touring cars at that time. <laughs> I heard this roaring going by the store, so he, he ran back to the end of the store to see if he, how far he'd gotten. And he was over by the sand beach area. They must have gone, figured he'd gone about 75 mm. miles an hour. <laughs> so those old time cars could really travel in those yeah. big cars. I guess there were some ferocious potholes in that old road, though, in the early days? Uh, I don't remember. See, in the early days, there weren't potholes because they weren't traveling fast enough. Uh, they were dusty, awful yeah. dusty. But How about uh, after a rain, though? What was it like after a big rain? Less dust. Well, uh, there were a lot of roads, <laughs> especially the side roads, where people would get stuck in them. Yeah. You know, go down the mud. And, sure, they'd just be ruts. They'd yeah, grow. and uh, see, it'd sink into the axle and they'd have to get pulled out. But uh, uh, there were, see, when I, I was a kid, I just, when the cars were just starting, see, I was born in 1908, and, and, was, and I can remember well, it was probably 1912, and then that was about the first cars. In fact, uh, a hole in it sold his place in the park for 13000 He bought a brand new 1912 Buick Touring. Mm -hmm. I suppose he paid about seven, eight hundred dollars for it, which yeah. was a lot of money at that time, but he had quite a, a fancy bit of car. Mm -hmm. was a lot of money. Yeah. Well, that was a pretty nice car. So we have the development of the Anderson Dock, uh, improvement of the road, and then the Goodrich, the arrangement with uh, the Goodrich line, I suppose, to bring people in. Development of the motor car, of course, had to make a tremendous difference. Uh, see, back in the, 20, or in the teens and 20s, then there was a big surge towards uh, Ephraim could have been a, a, a business community instead of a resort community. 
because they had, well, Anderson's dock was a big thing, and people, they had no dock in Bales Harbor where they could land, so everybody from Bales Harbor would yep. come over and get their freight here. And That's I don't know if you remember, but this, the warehouse would be stocked to the ceiling with freight when they came in. And uh, that was one big industry. And then they had, Anderson's had a cheese factory. Uh, that was, uh, well, it was stood there for many years, and then they, I don't know who got that. I think Randy Nilsson moved it up on his land. Where was it? It was um, right uh, east of the house there in that little hollow there. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, well, if you go by that uh, Anderson Lane, you'll see there's a little opening there, like a little field, and yeah. uh, Howard Olson bought the land there, so there's a trailer sitting in. Right in there is where the screamer is then. And then Clarence Smith, he had an enormous big store there. He had a company. A much bigger store than Anderson's. And, mm -hmm. uh, was that the one on the water? Yeah, yeah. it was on the water. Yeah. And uh, he had a creamery there. That was in back of the um, store where the store, where, where the, well, it's where the Alicia, not Alicia, but Mrs. Arvis Wilson's building. It was, and she had a dress shop and all that stuff. What did the creamery produce? Cheese and? Oh, butter. Just butter. butter. Just butter. Okay. Yeah. All right. The creamery only makes butter. All right. And uh, Henry Ibsen was the first, uh, well, he was the only butter maker they had there. He was the butter maker. You remember Henry Ibsen? Mm -hmm. Very, fairly good. Well, oh, you must remember him pretty well. He stayed here. He was around here till, well, he only passed away maybe 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. They had a cottage on the beach over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that's specialization, isn't it? A yeah. butter maker. Yeah. So I guess when he left here, then he went to. Cuba City and started his own, and uh, he done quite well with that. And then across from the hall, there, uh, my dad had a big sawmill. It was a two-story building. And yeah, where was that exactly? Uh, across from the village hall. We've got a picture of it showing the slides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whose land was that on? Did you uh, he own that land? No, I think it was on Clarence Smith's land. Okay. I think Clarence mm -hmm. probably was in partnership with him. But it was, he had everything, uh, planers, and could make doors, windows, and flooring, and well, you still got the sawdust is still in the bay here, just yeah. going back and forth. Well, that that come from the one on the beach down for the... <laughs> oh, you, you probably remember that yeah. one. Yeah, there was a big boiler down there on the beach for a long time. Yeah, that wasn't from his, that yeah. was... But his... Because he, his uh, steam engine, he ro drove off in there when he tore the building down. So that, and then there was a big... Right there was a big job Jim Hansen had. Mm -hmm. and they saw, they uh, sent out tan bark with a blue dolphin was... That was... Uh, uh, they called it a banking ground back in those days. Then they would put a tan bark out in there. They would to go in the swamp and they cut hemlocks and then they just take the bark off and they ship that to the tanneries and then the logs lay there. And then they also shipped cordwood from the same dock because my grandfather, my mother's side, he uh, got his neck broke. There was reef cutting cordwood and it tumbled over and broke his neck. He lived about six weeks, apparently, but if he had been now, he would have gotten cured, you yeah, know, sure. but because his spinal cord wasn't severe. And Jim, of course, he had this big store over there where the uh, the restaurant is across from Smitty, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, you, what was up at the Blue Dolphin again? You said a, a banking, ba banking ground. Banking ground. Well, they call it a banking ground. That Blue ground. Dolphin, not that one. Oh, I here. see. Okay, yeah, where the blue dolphin blue used dolphin. to be. And, uh, so they sort of cured the bark somehow, or well, just stockpiled they, they, it? They just sent the bark. They take the bark off the logs, and then they pile it up, and then okay. they ship it out. They go right. right to the tanneries, and the tanneries use this hemlock bark right. for tanning. Okay. And then they also pile the the, the, the log. I mean the uh, hardwood there. Mm -hmm. And there was a good thing like. All those storekeepers, you know, they would they would buy the uh, the, the cordwood from. I suppose they'd probably pay them a, a buck and a half cord, and they'd sell it for maybe two bucks. And uh, well, then they would charge their stuff at the store, and, they, <laughs> and usually they broke even, you know. So the store storekeeper made money both ways. <laughs> Jim had uh, he had that set up, and Clarence Smith didn't. He didn't have no doctor, but. Uh, but uh, Oslock had the dock, he done it the same way. But I mean, right about that time, there was an awful lot of business going on Ephraim. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. it started to slough off, and finally it went into entirely tourist business. Mars, whose dock was on the 
State Park show almost right across. There's a big uh, that, dip there. That, uh, Still, I guess. I don't remember who, who owned that, but that was another big dock to use that for shipping uh, lumber. Uh, not mm -hmm. for shipping uh, cordwood. Yeah. Up near the pump and, house? Well, yeah. Further out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was another dock that went out from. It was in between this building down here and Evergreen Beach, the old road, you can see it there yet to a certain mm -hmm. extent. That was the old German road that come down there. Mm -hmm. And right at the foot of that, they built a dock, they called that the German dock. Mm -hmm. And that went out, uh, you can still see the cribs from that. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, I guess they had loaded with cordwood and then the dock gave away and the cordwood all laid in the bottom. They just had a, a little like a, uh, 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 going out to it, they had a, a, a road, but that was, I suppose, it was just on piles and mm -hmm. it wasn't substantial enough to hold all the, because the outside was a good crib yeah. dock. Huh. Uh, was there competition among these dock owners for business, or how did that well, work? Well, I guess they had all the business they could handle, okay. uh, apparently, because right. they were sailing vessels in here loading all the time, you know. And then there was one more dock, which uh, was off the terrace there. That was for the stone quarry. They see that stone quarry operated, I think, probably around 1892, maybe 1900 or something like there. Is that really, is that a substantial operation, that stone quarry? Oh, yeah. Right? That was a big operation. They had a big office and everything there. They, uh, they had a quite unique way of loading. See, it was deep water up the shore, so the dock yeah. wasn't too long. <coughs> but they'd have a... They had two two tracks going down on the dock, and uh, then they uh, they would load a, a load um, a one car, and then the, the, that would go down, pull up the other car. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's, so there was no make nothing, uh, no no power needed. It just kept on going back and forth as it loaded one and go down. And that, they had uh, quarried out quite a bit there. Uh, but they they were mainly interested in rip wrap. The stones maybe weighing a five hundred to a thousand mm -hmm. pounds, mm -hmm. and they would by dropping them off this bluff, they would some, sometimes break. So too many of them broke, so they, they didn't pay them to mm -hmm. operate. And when they uh, now that must have been about nineteen six when they quit or something, nineteen seven. Uh, my dad bought the old. Uh, Stone Quay office, uh, and he tore it down. And used the lumber to build Doc Sneeberger's house, which you know. Oh, did he? Yeah. And then he, my dad, sold it to uh, Clarence. Uh, no, Jacob Smith, who originally started the Smith store, and then mm -hmm. Clarence, of course, he inherited it. And then Glenn Thorpe bought from Clarence. They see they moved to uh, Racine. And, the Smith did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, he hated to leave, but his wife. Folks were, Flora was her, uh, she was a daughter of the first, I think she was a daughter, you know, of Barrett owners. Mm. And so they, uh, she wanted to be by her folks, and he hated to go, but they had to go, and they mm. sold the whole thing to Glen Square for $8,000, including the house and the store fully stocked. <coughs> It was an enormous store because of the big side wing. Remember the side oh, yeah. wings on both well, sides? Big store. They had clothing and their hardware, nails, paint, it, it anything you wanted. stores in each one. Yeah, <laughs> you, you could buy uh, all the tools you needed for carpentry, squares, levels, mm -hmm. and hammers, and saws, and rope, and anything you wanted. It just like a, well, it was a big general store, yeah. that's what it was. What, what were the circumstances under which the Goodrich steamers began to make Ephraim a stop? to provide supplies and bring people, but uh, how did all this come about? Well, I suppose they uh, see that Goodrich line, I suppose they were probably running from Chicago to Green Bay. They, they couldn't have started until after the canal was built. So I don't remember what year the canal was built. Hmm. Uh, That's right, yeah. Around 1880, maybe. Somewhere mm -hmm. in there. Somewhere and, uh, so they, they would probably go from Chicago into Green Bay and then uh, maybe Sturgeon Bay and then as they found business up north they probably start stopping in Fish Creek and... Was most of this business in terms of provisions yeah. or people? Most or of it was uh, uh, provisions. And then later was, people? Yeah, 
you know, the people are secondary. They had state rooms on there. Yeah. I know, uh, I suppose, in the early 20s, they, I have, was down by the dock when they were, they were unloading, and they had, I think, two or three cars in there, and they would unload those, and people, instead of driving up, they'd <laughs> put the car in the boat and take a state mm -hmm. room. And, <laughs> In the next, well, I think it took 24 hours for Chicago to come up here. Then what? they, I, I, uh, all these stevedores on there, they would, or the deckhands, I suppose it would be, they'd soak the, the deck with water and then they'd all get a hold of her and slide her around. Of the cars, stuff. they can move around the yeah, cars, they, you they'd mean? They'd move yeah. them so they'd be slippery through there. Yeah. Three or four of them get a hold of her and push her right around. And then they drove her off right through that little ramp in front of the warehouse door there. I don't know how they, well, I suppose they drove the car probably in the warehouse and then drove it out the west door mm -hmm. because there wasn't room enough for them to, to turn around and get out because they had to go up that ramp, see. My Uncle Charlie stood away on a Goodrich boat once. Did you ever hear that story? <laughs> no. <laughs> he got on board and he stayed there. He went up to Mackinac and back again. He had a wonderful time. Free of charge? I guess they fed him. I don't know what the they charged him. Or not. I think he uh, was spoken to by his father when he got home. But uh, <laughs> he probably he probably had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Someone had to pay. Yeah, they used to have slot machines on those Goodrich boats too. Oh my gosh, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had. I guess they had good food. It was um, they had a lot of. I never did it, but a lot of them used to go to Fish Creek and get on for a quarter. They could ride yeah. Ephraim. Too. How how did people discover Ephraim? Uh, was well, it just so hot they, in Chicago uh, that they sought to they, I places think they, north? I think the Goodrich boats from possibly must have been running here before the, uh, because uh, apparently they had a few guests. Now I know that uh, Tilly used to take a few. Well, they probably come, uh, took a tour on the Goodrich boat and got off and maybe missed the boat. <laughs> Somebody took mm -hmm. them in. I guess mm -hmm. that's how it started. And then word of mouth, you think? Or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Because there wasn't a chamber of commerce no, back fortunate then. Fortunately, not. Yeah. <laughs> so that was. Let me ask Jim a question. If if Iverson could come back and spend a week in Ephraim, what do you think would surprise him most about the village? Now. I think he'd turn around and go away. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, look, Paul, it's more than a hundred years. I mean, uh, everything would surprise him surely. You know. What, what, how do you think he might react? Uh, well, if you were his host, for example, what would you most like to show him in Ephraim? I guess I'd like to show him that his house was still here. I don't know what else <laughs> that, he, That's nice, What yeah. else would he remember? Uh, everything else yeah, is I, different. I don't know what show him. But the view remains the same? Uh, no, the view doesn't remain the same. It's all grown up. Uh, the place was all skinned off in the beginning. True, yeah. But I mean, looking out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I had an argument with a fellow that spoke at our men's club one night. He was a conservationist. I think he was. Uh, but anyway, he was trying to tell me that there wasn't that uh, the, there wasn't anywhere. As near, I said, I told him, I said, there's more trees growing in, in Dora County right now than there was a uh, hundred years ago. Oh, no, 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 no. I said everything was cut off completely. Sure. Everything was sure. denuded. Sure. The only place that wasn't cut off was uh, Tufts Point over there. That's virgin yeah. timber mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. But now you take, uh, look at all the farms. They they mm -hmm. quit farming and planted them in trees. Mm -hmm. Wherever you go, the, the, you know, the whole swamp is full of trees. And wherever you go, there's trees, right? Now this. You go look at um, Iverson's watercolor in the church, and you'll see uh, yeah, the, the, the whole, cliff and the, the island all been skimmed off. Yeah. You see, the island uh, that um, uh, Larson, uh, he, he, he was there up. first and started lumbering. Was it, no, he, no, he uh, he cut wood for the passing that's steamer. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so he oh. denuded the island. And then <laughs> when that was denuded, then he moved to shore. Oh, sure, and started he was going. the first of the developers. Yeah. <laughs> well, he didn't develop yeah. nothing. He just uh, cut. cut it off and he went ashore. Of course, there are a lot of developers who don't de develop anything either. No. Maury, who was the biggest rascal you ever knew in early Ephraim? I guess they didn't have time to be reprobates. They were busy trying to stay right. alive. And well, they let the, let the ladies do the work for them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is that true? I mean, did, were the ladies the real brains of the village? Is that well, Morris ran through all the hotel yeah. ladies. Uh, right. Sure, they, they, they invented the tourist trade, I think. They actually, uh, 
Well, I see it's um, <laughs> behind every successful man there's a woman, they say. Right. <laughs> and that apparently is what happened That's here. Right. I don't know if they were all successful or not. But... Who was the most successful of the women in the village in the old days? Lizzie? Well, I don't know how you'd call her the most successful because she uh, she just run the store and yeah. I mean she didn't do nothing phenomenal in there because it was just uh, kept on as though Oslock had started it. It was just, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't see anything phenomenal about her. Uh, she was a nice woman and she took care of the village books. Uh, and that, in fact, I don't think any of them were really phenomenal, but they all took a part of the, of the things in the village. They had the ladies' aid back in those days, the same as they have it now, and they, now it's the Women's Fellowship, I guess, whatever. But anyway, they, they were a, a big thing in the village because they raised money for the church and they put on different things. Besides Iverson, what male do you think, what male stands out, what man stands out as having had the greatest impact on the development of Ephraim? Well, on the development, I, I don't know. Uh, one of the greatest men, the, the finest men I ever knew was David Stevens. Uh, you know him. Oh, very well, sure. And we I lived, lived right two blocks from him in Chicago. Uh, and but so uh, in my own. mind, he was the finest man I ever knew. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I think you'll agree with me. Halfway. Uh, he was a uh, summer resident. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. but he'd done an awful lot for the village. And another one was Warren Davis. He was, uh, mm -hmm. he was, nice man. He was a nice man. and uh, he, uh, he was, and Neither one of them actually were looking for glory, but they did an awful lot of things for the village. And I think those two were about the most outstanding of anybody I knew. Uh, Who comes to your mind, Jim? I guess I'd about leave it there, uh, but in the kind of society that it was back then, uh, there wasn't much opportunity to stand out, but the village sort of happened. I mean, it wasn't planned, it wasn't developed, it uh, uh, grew, and then it was uh, overwhelmed by events, I think, and not by design. Well, you guys get You get the, I mean, the, the last hundred, whatever it is, 50 years have changed a good many things everywhere, of course, but uh, uh, here, uh, after you get the wooden spokes and roads in and so on, it, uh, it just slowly developed along until post-war you begin to get big roads and you begin to get a lot of free money and you begin to get a bunch of carpetbaggers coming in developing the place. And you got an article in the National Geographic, which is uh, oh, poisonous. yes. Yeah. Was that a milestone that oh, night? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the interesting. Chamber of Commerce in Sturgeon Bay had sweated for years to get an article on the county in, and they finally succeeded. And it was quoted to me that a fellow at the National Geographic said, any time we do an article like this on a region of this comparable sort, real estate prices will double in two years. For heaven's sakes. And what year was this? It's pretty nearly right. What, 20 years ago? Maybe? Yeah. About. Hmm. I can ask my Aunt Harriet. She still has her problem. I'll see what she says. Jim, yeah. as, a, as a child in the summertime in Ephraim, what do you remember uh, most enjoying doing? Anything come to mind? No, well, there was nothing, uh, nothing much to do, so you entertained yourself. You could. Uh, Walk around and you could catch snakes and butterflies and pick berries and uh, you could uh, walk around again and uh, <laughs> since it was an extended family, wherever you walked, everybody knew you. And, uh, well, you used to do a lot of sailing. Well, yeah, a little bit, a lot of sailing. Uh, it was a wonderful period and I had the only sailboat in the harbor. Hmm. Well, my dad made that. Yes, he did. <laughs> made one for Morrison over here too. That's right. I sailed in that one. I was very small. Where is the sailboat now? Well, I think well, it's down there painted red, isn't it? Yeah, it's down is it? in the yard by the 
Uh, I gave it to Morris yeah, at I was the end because it, he was, was going to fix it, it and use it for a fishing boat, but he didn't. It and, was uh, a little too much repair on it, so I had it lay in there. Yeah. So now it's grown, grown a head and grown a tail and turned itself red and has yeah. a tree growing out. Yeah. <laughs>